Hey kids, it's time to pay attention. Heritage, history, the American Republic. Chapter five, episode one. Now well, this is section one. Great Britain's power grew in the 1700s. Britain added to its empire in both the Americas and India. It also acquired islands in the Pacific and territory in Australia and many other lands. As Britain focused on other areas in its empire, the 13 colonies continued to enjoy freedom in handling their own affairs. Although the colonists were willing to fight alongside the British against common enemies, they were not willing to give up the liberty they enjoyed. The colonists were offended when the British treated them like second-class citizens. The colonists believed they were equal to the Englishmen and should be treated as such. You're darn Caton. The French and Indian War at the outset of the 18th century, France and Britain were the two leading European powers. Both nations were actively involved in building overseas empires. By establishing new colonies, they hoped to increase their wealth and power. The intense rivalry between the two led to a series of wars. The Background of the Struggle North America was important to both the French and the British. While the British settled the Atlantic seaboard, the French settled along the St. Lawrence River in the Great Lakes region. The French also settled by the Mississippi River. Both groups, however, claimed the whole continent. Both wanted control of the fur trade in the vast open territory west, uh, in the vast open territory west of the Appalachian Mountains. They also wanted the rich fisheries off the coast of Newfoundland. Before long, their rival interests led to open conflict. French Advantages and Disadvantages <clears throat> The French had many advantages in their struggle against the British. The French colonial government was strong and unified. The French built forts at strategic points along the inland waterways. They also had a well-trained army and the support of many Indian tribes who hated the British, especially the Algonquins. Despite these advantages, the French had one major weakness— New France was a vast territory with widely scattered and sparsely populated French settlements. Defending such a large region was difficult. British Advantages and Disadvantages <clears throat> The British colonies had a few advantages as well. They had nearly 15 times the population of New France. In addition, they had the support of the Iroquois. Iroquois, the strongest confederation of Indian tribes in America and the English Navy was the strongest in the world. Perhaps Britain's greatest weakness was a lack of unity among its colonies. There was no central organization in, there was no central organization in and little cooperation among the 13 colonies. And there was little cooperation between the colonies and the British government. Each colony protected its own interests rather than the interests of the colonies as a whole. When faced with Indian attacks and French expansion, many colonies, unless they were personally threatened, did not want to help the other colonies. The colonists were willing to take action only to defend their homes, families, and livelihoods. Early Wars Between 1689 and 1763, the rivalry between France and Britain led to four wars. The first three conflicts broke, broke out in Europe and spread to America. The results of these three wars were indecisive. Neither side could gain an upper hand. The fourth war, however, decided who would control the North American continent. In this last war, fighting broke out in America two years before it began in Europe. Europeans named it the Seven Years War. The American colonists called it the French and Indian War because the French and the Indians joined forces against the British and the colonists. So the first three conflicts, it's over on the side, were called King William's War from 1689 to, uh, to 1697, Queen Anne's War, 1702 to 1713, and King George's War, 1744 to 1748. So the next one. The Outbreak of War. The struggle for control of the Ohio Valley became the immediate cause of the French and Indian War. The British hoped to open the region to settlement. This plan alarmed the French, who feared that British settlers would disrupt the French fur trade. 
the French wanted to gain control, stop further British expansion, and keep the British colonists hemmed, hemmed in along the Atlantic coast. The key to the Ohio Valley was the point where the Allegheny and Monongahela, ooh, I said it right, yay, Monongahela rivers joined to form the Ohio River, the present site of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In 1754, some Virginians began in, oh gosh, I can't read you guys, this is crazy. In 1754, some Virginians began building a fort at the site. The governor of Virginia set, sent a force under the leadership of George Washington to protect them. But before the force arrived, the French attacked the unfinished fort and drove off the Virginians. The French completed the fort and named it Fort Duquesne in honor of their new Canadian governor. As Washington and his troops advanced to the fort, they met and defeated a small French force. Learning of a larger French force nearby, Washington fell back and hastily constructed a stockade nearby. Not, sorry. Ugh. Constructed a stockade called Fort Necessity. A much larger French force was then sent out to meet the British colonial troops. After an unsuccessful defense, Washington's outnumbered men were forced to surrender. The French allowed them to return to Virginia. This fight on July 3rd, 1754, marked the beginning of the French and Indian War. The Course of the War During the early years of the war, the French successfully drove the British from the Ohio Valley. Indian tribes, in league with the French, used a style of fighting that was very effective in the wilderness, it was called guerrilla warfare. The Indians hid behind trees and brush, ready to ambush the British. In contrast, the British used the European style of fighting. They went into battle dressed in full uniform and marched in rank. The rows of colorfully dressed soldiers made easy targets for Indians hiding in the forests. That wasn't very effective. The Albany Plan of Union. Both the British and the colonists were concerned about the Indian threat to the colonies. In particular, they were afraid that the Iroquois would join the French in their fight. A meeting was called to deal with this concern. In June 1754, delegates from several American colonies met at Albany, New York. At the Albany Congress, colonial leaders met with some Iroquois chiefs and persuaded them to support the British. On the side, it says George Washington, leader of the Virginia troops. I heard the bullets whistle, and believe me, there is something charming in the sound. George Washington after his first battle. The Congress also set out to accomplish a more important goal. The delegates at the Congress adopted a plan of union and submitted it to the colonies. The plan was primarily the work of Benjamin Franklin. The, Al the <clears throat> Albany Plan of Union called for the creation of a grand council made up of delegates from all the colonies. The assembly would have the power to raise an army, build forts, and govern Indian affairs. But both Britain and the colonies rejected the plan. Britain feared that such a union would threaten its control of their colonies. And the colonies feared that they might lose some of their freedom. Even so, the plan was significant because it was the first attempt to unite the American colonies. Braddock's Defeat The first major British action in the war was, to, was the attempt to capture Fort Duquesne, British General Edward Braddock took about 1,500 British soldiers and 1,000 Virginia militiamen and marched, you can walk through Vinny, from Virginia to the fort. George Washington was an aide to Braddock on the mission. Braddock moved his men slowly, having them clear a roadway and build bridges as they marched. The French and their Indian allies ambushed Braddock's forces near Fort Duquesne on July 9th, 1755. Excuse me, we had tacos for dinner. The British were defeated and Braddock was mortally wounded. The loss discouraged the British and left the colonists wary of British support. However, the colonists now had a new road that would be useful in future settlement of the frontier. William Pitt's System. In 1756, the war became a worldwide conflict. The British and the French battled on three continents, North America, Europe, and Asia. To meet the new challenges, the struggling British placed the war effort in the hands of the British Secretary of State, William Pitt. His energetic leadership brought a dramatic change in the war. 
Pitt turned Britain's weak defensive tactics in America to aggressive action. He replaced older generals with younger, more talented. Gosh, I can't read. He replaced older generals with younger, more talented ones. And he agreed that the British would pay to outfit colonial soldiers and to aid British troops. Now backed, now backed with the full support of the British government, British troops teamed with the American colonials and British troops teamed with American colonials and began their assault on French strongholds in America. One by one, French posts began falling to the British. Late in 1758, a British force ousted the French from Fort Duquesne. The British rebuilt the badly damaged fort and renamed it Fort Pitt. The following year, they began preparing to capture Quebec. Pitt hoped that the capture would be the crucial blow that would defeat the French. The Battle of Quebec, or Quebec, they call it Quebec up there. That's how you say it in French, Quebec. Quebec was the strongest city of New France. Perched high above the St. Lawrence River and protected by steep cliffs, it was a seemingly invincible fortress. Nevertheless, the British, under the command of General James Wolfe, besieged the city. But the French were content to stay within their stronghold and wait. After several failed attempts to take the city, General Wolfe hatched a daring plan. Under cover of night, British troops crossed the river downstream from the fort. By morning, on September 13, 1759, more than 4,000 British troops had silently scaled the cliffs protecting Quebec. They took up battle positions on a plain called the Plains of Abraham, which was a short distance from the fortress. When the surprised French commander, the Marquis de Montcalm, learned what the British had done, he ordered an immediate attack. He hoped to defeat the British before they could become entrenched. But the British routed the French and their Indian allies. Okay, but the French routed the, the British, oh my gosh. But the British routed the French and their Indian allies. Both Wolfe and Montcalm were mortally wounded in the battle. The French, with their commander dead and their troops disorganized, surrendered Quebec. Results of the war. Although the British did not capture Montreal until 1760, for all practical purposes, the fall of Quebec spelled the defeat of New France. The struggle for North America was over, but the war in Europe continued until 1763, when the Treaty of Paris was negotiated. France gave up its claim to all territory east of the Mississippi River, except New Orleans. <laughs> Britain gained control of Canada and received Florida from Spain, which had been a French ally. To compensate Spain for the loss of Florida, France gave Spain the Louisiana Territory. Wow. That's cool. So uh, there's a thing about Benjamin Franklin over here. I'll read that in just a second, but I'll do the section quiz here. So number one, explain by wo why both France and Britain wanted North America. You guys remember, it's in the beginning. Two, what war settled the question of who would control North America? What was this war called in Europe? Compare the advantages, number three, compare the advantages of the French and the British in fighting the war. There's a whole section about that. Number four, explain the significance of the Albany Plan in Union, uh, excuse me, the Albany Plan of Union. Explain the significance of the Albany Plan of Union. <clears throat> And the star is describe how the colonists' individualism hurt the British war effort. I could give you the answer, but you have to figure it out. So describe how the colonists' individualism hurt the British war effort. It means they want to do their own thing, right? Individualism. So Benjamin Franklin. Historians have long referred to Benjamin Franklin as the first American as a printer, scientist, inventor, diplomat, and philanthropist, he was widely known. He spent much of his life serving his country and trying to improve the lives of others. Franklin was born in Boston in 1706 to a chandler with 10 older children. What's a chandler do? You guys remember? As a member of such a large family, Franklin was apprenticed to his much older brother, James, who, who was a printer. Occasionally, Franklin wrote letters to his brother's newspaper, the New England Courant, under the pen name Silence Do Good. 
<laughs> when James found out that the middle-aged do-good was in reality his younger brother, he became quite angry. At age 17, Franklin ran away from his apprenticeship and ended up in Philadelphia. He soon established himself as a printer. He published the Pennsylvania Gazette and Poor Richard's Almanac, which was known for its wise sayings and advice. Franklin was so successful as a printer that he was able to retire at an early age and pursue his various interests. Meanwhile, he and his wife, Deborah Reed Franklin, reared two children. Franklin was a thoroughly enlightened thinker. Influenced by the Enlightenment, he hoped to improve himself and the world around him. In 1727, he organized the Junto, a club that sought to improve its members and society. Part of the Junto's work was establishing a militia, a lending library, the University of Pennsylvania, and an insurance company. Ooh, I'm an insurance agent. That's cool. The club also founded Philadelphia's first volunteer fire department and its first public hospital. In 1743, Franklin participated in founding the American Philosophical Society, the first American society for learning. Franklin earned fame in Europe and America for his scientific experiments. He was especially famous for his work with electricity. He determined that thunderclouds carry electricity and that lightning is like a giant spark. While experimenting with electricity, he invented the lightning rod to protect buildings from lightning strikes. His other inventions include bifocals. I'm wearing bifocals right now. Thanks, Ben. Uh, a glass harmonica, the iron stove, and the odometer. Well, that's cool. Franklin was also known for his diplomatic efforts. In 1754, he drafted the Albany Plan of Union. Between 1757 and 1775, he represented the colonies in England. In the colonies in 1776, he was on the committee that created the Declaration of Independence. Later that year, he was sent to Paris to seek military aid for the colonies. He remained in France throughout the War for Independence and helped negotiate the Treaty of Paris. He stayed until the document was signed in 1783. At the Constitutional Convention in 1787, he was the oldest delegate. Although Franklin believed that mankind, mankind's highest good is found in morality and integrity, he did not often follow his own advice. He had an illegitimate son, William, who was a colonial governor of New Jersey and a Tory during the War for Independence. Franklin was also a deist, a deist, sorry, he was also a deist. Despite all his efforts to improve himself and do good to others, he fell short of God's mark, but he was well aware of his shortcomings. Commenting on his attempts to become humble, Franklin mused, Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome pride, I should probably be proud of my humility. Franklin knew of the gospel. Gospel. He was a good friend with the evangelist George Whitefield. He, Whitfield, excuse me, that's George Whitefield. <clears throat> Hold on. Franklin knew of the gospel. He was good friends with the evangelist George Whitefield. He printed Whitfield's sermons and gave money to su support an orphanage run by Whitfield. But despite these good deeds, Franklin was not saved. In a letter to Franklin, Whitfield wrote, As you have made a pretty considerable progress in the mysteries of electricity, I should now humbly recommend to you, to your diligent, unprejudiced study, the mystery of the new birth. Sadly, however, there is no evidence that Franklin ever trusted Christ. I think that's it, guys. That's section one. So there you go. Chapter five, section one. Pay attention. You can go through it again and again and again. Uh, and I want to see good grades, you guys. I'll do chapter section two next. <laughs>